Welcome, welcome everyone. I see lots of uh, friendly faces, some brand new names, some, uh, some names I've seen before. It is an absolute pleasure to see um, all of you coming and joining. Good day, Jim. Good day, John. It is so wonderful. Hello, Magda. Um, don't forget the chat is open. Uh, it is available for, for your typing pleasure. Let me know if the top topic or comment resonates with you today. Um, don't forget to also tell me where you're from uh, and uh, we'll be starting in just a minute. Oh, I, uh, I, I get so back to back on some days that uh, I, I try to, uh, I feel like I'm back in my old corporate sales days. I have like five minutes and I'm like, I cram down lunch. I'm like, num, 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 num. And I'm like, oh, okay. But now it's like stuck in my throat. So <laughs> The, uh, the joys, the joys of uh, living, uh, really feeling what, what it's like to be a part of, part of all of this. Um, it is the top of the hour. We will get started in just a minute because I keep hearing all of the, the doorbells ringing as people are, are welcoming themselves in. Uh, welcome in Virginia, Oakland, Calgary, Stetler. Oh my goodness, we have so many wonderful people joining us today. Um, feel free to even tell you, like, you know, if you want to say, you know, what your company is, what your industry is. Uh, we'll be talking a little bit about, funny enough, um, the, some of the examples I've used today are engineering companies. Surprisingly, I know, I know. Engineers don't have emotions, Kim. What are you talking about? This is why I use them as one of the examples. But as much as possible, I love hearing from where everybody's coming from and what kind of industry they're working from, because it does help me to change and update some of the information as we go forward. We work with a lot of different industries, a lot of different types of companies. So as much as I can, I like to, uh, to help you out uh, with the information that we're getting. Yeah, John's giving me, he's like, oh my goodness. He's like, you know, your, uh, all your conversations about eating lunch really fast. I know, I know, right? Um, Denise from Clinical Research, Scott from Illinois. Yes, you're absolutely welcome, Scott. Um, Chantal in London, Ontario, also in Clinical Research as well. Uh, fantastic. Uh, and we have a few more people just coming in. We are at the two minutes afterwards, teacher's pension. Oh, yeah. Oh, no products, only education. Education is my livelihood now, uh, Jim. So I feel you. And my ideas in the pet industry. Wonderful, wonderful. So I will, um, I will do my best, but keep the keep your chats and everything um, available. If I, I will save time at the very end of today's uh, of today's webinar um, to answer any questions and conversations that you might have. Um, if I do find myself with time, even during the entire, um, the entire process, I will answer them going ahead. Um, don't forget to keep yourself on mute. Um, I've, I've muted uh, one other person here, Winnipeg, Alberta, or sorry, Winnipeg Media, Digital Marketing. Yes. Um, oh, thank you, Chantel. I, oh, my podcast. Oh, my goodness. Thank you. I haven't done the podcast in like oh, probably almost four years now. I, uh, I was, it was something I love. I would love to take, get back into it. Um, my son was born and I took a hiatus from it. I had to decide that something had to fall apart. And uh, it was the podcast and I miss it. I miss it so much. So we'll talk about empathy and sales, the emotional tie that really helps us to sell more faster. I want to start off with a story. Okay. Um, so this was about uh, two years ago, maybe a year ago or so. I was uh, working with this woman. This woman had called me up. She, uh, she was the principal in an engineering firm. And she says, Kim, we need your help. She's, she says, you know, things have changed. And, and even before COVID and everything, uh, where I'm from, oil and gas really takes over a lot of our economy. And the oil and gas mar um, market was not doing very well at this point in time. And specifically what her engineering firm was, they did a lot of environmental engineering specifically for these types of companies. And she goes, you know, the economy has been doing so poorly. She's like, you know, and we're in a situation where she's like, I don't know what's happening. She's like, I don't even know day to day where the business is going to come from, where our clients are going to come from. She's like, I am so lost right now. She's like, I need your help. Can you come in and just have a conversation with me about how I can help to get these engineers to sell? And I said, yes, I would absolutely love to. And as we go through the conversations about who her clients are, how she's finding more business, what are some of the conversations that they're ultimately having? I noticed that we were talking very much on a very logical 
type of level. This is what I know. This is what I think. This is what we've done in the past. This is our plans for the future. And in that moment, there was still something missing. There was something missing from the conversation. And I asked her, I said, Liz, how would it feel if nothing changes in your business? And in that moment, she looked at me, she bit her bottom lip, and I could already see she was holding back the tears. And she says, I can't let that happen. She says, Kim, these people, they are my family. And she's like, and I've seen other businesses, other engineering firms just like ours, downsize, go bankrupt, decide that they're no longer going to pursue what they want. She's like, I cannot do that. They are my family and I cannot let down my family. And I said, okay. And if everything that you're telling me, getting new clients, maximizing the clients that you've already had, when you were able to do that, how would that make you feel? And that held back tears turned to the smile. And I could see her radiating all this emotion. And she goes, that's exactly what we need. Now, in those two questions, before we had discussed a solution, before we had to discuss pricing, I knew I was getting the deal. How did I know? Because we touched on why it was so important for her to make a change and what it would do for her, her business, her as a leader, her in able to be able to help her, not only her own personal family, but the people, the employees that she saw as her family. Knowing that we were going to be able to create that connection, that transformation, that emotional connection was enough for us to continue to pursue a couple more meetings and eventually get the deal. But I knew in that first meeting, based on those questions, the way she had answered them, the way we allowed ourselves the space to absorb the response that I was going to get the deal. So I'm gonna give you how we ultimately did this and what are some of the things that you can do today, today in your own sales cycles, to have in meeting number one, to know in your gut that you're going to be able to close more business faster. So my personal sales background, I worked for a few different companies. Before I owned uh, KO Advantage Group, I had ex experience with Xerox, Clarion, American Express, Purolator. All of those companies, if you notice from their logos, if you're familiar with them or you're not, what they all have in common is they are a premium price in the market. What sets them apart is not the product that they sell but rather the way they communicate with their clients. And one of the things that we did differently in KO Advantage Group, specifically in our program, KO Sales U, was we touched on the value of emotional intelligence. This was something that was always seen as the, the thing that set apart the top echelon of reps from the very bottom. But until we were able to actually communicate this, until we said, this is how you can specifically do this, and the research will actually show us, that was ultimately what made us so successful. For me, myself, it wasn't something that any of these companies ever taught, but rather something that I subconsciously was attuned to throughout my process, knowing that every single time I spoke with a client, that we were going to have to touch at some point the emotional conversation that this included. So my company today, we are KO Advantage Group and we really connect you with your clients using skill sets such as emotional intelligence to ultimately get those higher value deals. What do we give you? We give you more sleep <laughs> and who could use more of that? 
more sleep knowing that you're not keeping yourself up at night anymore. You are not stressing, you are not crying in your pillow, not knowing where the revenue is coming from. When is it going to close? When is this ultimately going to happen? We're gonna give you the tools so that you can ask the right questions and ultimately make those deals happen faster. You're going to get empowerment because right from day one, right from that first 20 minute conversation with a client, right from that very first meeting, you know that you were talking with the right clients. And I know this from personal experience because every single one of those companies, I felt like I was running in a hamster wheel at some point in my career. I was running after the deal, running after the deal, running after the deal, the deal that would never happen because the client was all wrong. But we were never taught how to discern what a good client from a bad client would actually look like. Minus the fact that they either have money or they don't, but it turns out there's other things that we actually wanna watch for. And finally, less anxiety, less uncertainty, more knowledge in knowing that you are doing the right things at the right time. This is me today. I am LinkedIn's most influential sales leader to follow. Most of you have actually followed me on LinkedIn or you, you maybe found us on LinkedIn. Let me know if that's where you're finding us or if you're already a part of our, of our network, of our tribe, maybe a graduate of our program. I've seen a few graduate and current student names on there. I am Success Magazine's most influential sales leader to follow. Um, I am a three-time author. That is my third book, Sell More Faster. You can get it wherever you buy your books. I do recommend um, if you you choose to purchase it to go ahead and find it at a local retail store as opposed to Amazon call up your small book retailer ask them to specially order it just for you support small business and finally I am startup Canada's female entrepreneur of the year so I want to start off with a little game because we can't talk about emotional intelligence unless we talk about the things that really involve us, right? Who are we? What kind of people do we need to be? So in the chat, I want you to answer this question for me. Who do you think makes the best salespeople? Is it introverts or is it extroverts? Maybe it's something in between. I don't know, right? Is it people that consider themselves to, you know, recharge by going ahead and doing the Netflix and chill? Or is it those people that go out and like, you know, love to network, right? They're handing out business cards as if they're Drake hanging out the six with dollar bills, right? Who are the people that ultimately change? Because this actually is a really important question. When I worked for Xerox, before I worked for Xerox, they would typically make us go through several different interviews. One of those interview processes actually include a personality assessment. And based on that personality assessment, they then decided whether you were worthy of another interview or not. I see a few people even in here in HR outsourcing, um, recruitment as well. So I, I know that there's a few people. So we have, there's no, Alan says, John says it's the same. Um, Alan says that there's no bearing. It really doesn't matter. Stella says extroverts, introverts who have charisma. Ne um, oh, and she, yes, where she's from. Um, and it doesn't really matter. You can use your skills, how it is reflected in the client. So yes, and I see a couple more of you adding some answers in there. Um, that actually, so, so I love the fact that you're like, it really doesn't matter. It actually does. And they've, they've done research. So one of my favorite researchers is a gentleman named Adam Grant. Uh, he has written a lot of different books. Um, he's written Give and Take. He's written um, the, the uh, Conformity or Nonconformity. I can't remember which one it is. Um, as well as one of my personal favorites um, from last year. Uh, it was... Oh my goodness, now I can't even remember, but it was co-written with Sheryl Sandberg, which actually talked a lot about emotional intelligence as well. So I do recommend that one too. Your heart will like bleed throughout this entire story. He, uh, so Adam Grant is a tenured um, Wharton School of Business professor. And he went to a call center and he actually, he number one, he did a quick personality assessment with all of the different call center people. And then at the end of their day, he said, okay, how much did everybody sell according to their personality? And he was able to perfectly skew this in an arc. And what he found was that on average, introverts, those that scored the very lowest in the introversion scale, um, actually sc uh, scored slightly higher than extreme extroverts. Why? Why is this? Because for the most part, what he found was that when an extreme extrovert was speaking to a client, 
they ended up speaking to the person so much that the, the client ended up feeling that they were, they were being talked into a corner. They felt like they had no, uh, no opportunity to object with a question, to find out more. And they felt ultimately if they did choose to buy that they were coerced into the buying decision, not that they came to their own resolve on it. So introverts were able to score a little bit higher because they didn't do that same amount of talking with the person. They allowed the other person to talk. But who scored the best? For those of you that says it didn't really matter, there was no result, there's actually this, this term called ambiverts, which is somebody that floats right perfectly in the middle, right in this like, you know, kind of three and a half to like about a five and a half. Most of us, including yours truly, will actually fall in this extreme side of, of the business, right? Where we love to go ahead and we can be on stage. We can go ahead and be in a networking environment. We can do all of that. But the moment we are done, I want to just Netflix and chill. I joke with people when I do stand up, speak on stage because I said, I will bring it and I will give you tons of energy. But at the end of this, please don't come rushing at me with a ton of questions because I am exhausted. I have given you everything I have and I literally just want to stand in a corner. It took a lot of strength and energy for me to get out of that, to be able to continue to, to bring the energy that I needed. Abby Wirtz scored so well because they knew when to talk and they knew when to shut up and listen. They knew how to ask the right questions and how to turn those questions into information that they could ultimately use. So if we're going to talk about emotional intelligence. We have to ask ourselves, how do you know someone is fully listening to you? If we're going to be able to create this give and take, part of this give is also the take portion. We need to know that person's listening to us, but alternatively, if we know how somebody is fully listening to us, we can be very self-aware if we are fully listening to someone else. Ah, there's the key. So what are some of the things that we watch for when somebody is actively listening to us? Active listening in general involves all the senses. And you know this, when you are having a really good cup of coffee with a friend, when you're sitting down with somebody that you haven't heard in a really long time, maybe they're just telling such a riveting story. You're like on the edge of your seat. You, you can feel your heart rate start to rise and fall. You feel your breath slow down. You hold it if the, you're in a suspenseful moment. You can feel yourself bubble up. You can, you can taste at whatever they're describing, if they're describing food. It involves all of this, even though all you're really using are your ears, but you're watching them. You're providing them eye contact. You're also not just listening to what's being said, but you're listening to hear. You're listening to the inflections and tonality, the way somebody quiets their voice if it's something very suspenseful. The way you get energized when the person brings their energy up. And in turn, when we are listening to them, we clarify, we summarize what we've heard, and we get the other person to agree. When we are not actively listening, we don't listen to all the things that the person is saying because we hear their first statement and then we're immediately thinking about how do I challenge them on that? How do I think that? And we didn't hear where the person talked themselves out of it. And ultimately what we're doing is we're allowing the person to go three steps forward and we're bringing them two steps back as opposed to continuously working on the conversation together. There's an old saying, and we need to remind ourselves of this one from time to time. We have two ears and one mouth, so we can listen twice as often as we speak. When you are in your sales meetings, if you're graced with an hour of someone's time, I want you to be cognizant of the time that you have been given and make sure that you are spending at least two thirds of that meeting asking questions finding out more about the other person, asking and listening to them more and more. I'm currently in the process of, of onboarding a brand new salesperson in my own team. And one of the things I had him do is I said, listen, you're going to hear me do a sales call. And I don't want you to listen to what I tell the person. I don't want you to listen to the advice. I want you to listen to the questions I ask. And what you will notice is in my own sales cycles, I will do very little talking. And it is amazing when you ask the right questions, how much information 
you can get from the other person as opposed to how much information you have to give the other person to then take and do something with. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't specifically talk about video calls. So I did want to include this piece in today's conversation because the world has changed. And in all honesty, I don't see it ever going 100% completely back. I think video calls are the way that we're going to start communicating at least 50% of the time when we have in-person meetings. And so what we want to be aware of is how do we communicate differently if it's a video call versus an in-person interview interaction. When we're in person, we know we are actively listening to somebody because we're staring at their eyes. On a video call, this can be very difficult because it's not that we're staring at their eyes, we're staring at a screen. And even if we're looking at their eyes, if I was looking at someone's eyes, I might be looking down here and you can notice the gaze on how it changes. So we have to get very good at our peripheral vision if we're going to be using video calls more, making sure that we're staring at the camera and not at an area of the screen. How we can ultimately do this is help to change and elevate your camera screen. In my case, if, I, if you saw from the background looking over, what you would see is I actually have a little raised table on top of my desk. When I sit down, I can go ahead and type at my computer. When I present, I stand up, I elevate myself, I have a conversation very naturally the same way I would, but I'm also looking at the camera. So what are we listening for? If listening is so important, what are we listening for and how is that going to help us tie into emotional intelligence? So we wanna start listening for emotional inflections. In Amer North America, we do this by, we actually will inflect our voice at the very end, end, right? We, we actually will choose to, to move ourselves elevated or we will bring ourselves down down to show the, the strength of the conversation. In places like Australia, they actually do that in the beginning. They will inflect their, their words at the beginning. And in um, Europe, they actually, I think they do it in the middle or it's vice versa, I can't remember. But we can listen for those inflections. We wanna listen for those happy states. And as you're listening to the person, ask yourself, what am I feeling in this moment as they're describing the story. Am I feeling happy? Am I feeling content? Am I feeling frustrated? Am I feeling aggravated? Whatever that's feeling. And we will actually use that emotions later on with the other person. Because emotional intelligence is so critical to the sales cycle. It's not even just critical to the sales cycle. It's actually critical to business, any type of business. Emotional intelligence or emotional quotient, EI or EQ, is a relatively new area of research. There was a gentleman, Dr. Goldberg, who literally wrote the book Emotional Intelligence back, I think, in 1994. So 26 years ago, I'm trying to do my math. I, I keep, somehow I keep losing the 2010s. I don't know if I'm the only one that does this. I, I, my husband and I were talking and he goes, what do you mean 16 years ago? It was like 26 years ago. And I'm like, oh my goodness, I've lost a decade. I'm like, at what age do you start losing decades? <laughs> and so emotional intelligence really determines how connected are we with ourselves and how connected are we with those around us? And what, what the research has shown us is that EQ and EI, will contribute higher to a person's level of success than intelligence and technical skills combined. So what we'll typically find is if you're out there applying or hiring, you'll find that people will ask you for skill sets and everything, and that might get you the job, but it doesn't necessarily keep you there. It doesn't necessarily determine whether you are going to be successful in that role. What they found when they've done research is they found that executives, um, departments to departments or companies to companies, those that are placed as, as scoring higher in their emotional quotient, or if they're trained and they can actually increase their emotional quotient, because this is something that we can train people to do, is that they will outperform either themselves or similar executives by almost 20% more. And in some cases I saw a stat that was like 22% more. Significant, almost a quarter more in revenue. Imagine what that would do for your business, just by training on one skill set.
There was a cosmetics company, I think it was Estee Lauder, but they actually took this research and they started to hire, not based on what the skill set of was somebody with uh, makeup skills, but rather was somebody who had, you know, emotional intelligence skills. And what they found was peer to peer, those that were hired with higher emotional quotient ended up selling $91,000 more in revenue than their peers. So the quickest way to get more business today is going to be to enhance today's skill set. So there's a five-step pyramid for, the, for the, the purposes of today's conversation. We're only going to talk about the first four. And it's very much that Sun Tzu art of war, right? Know thyself, know thy enemy. And not that we ever want to see our clients as the enemy. They are not by no means. But the, what Sun Tzu did get right is to know thyself first before you know anyone else. Really get in tune with what is going on with you. And so from an emotional intelligence standpoint, this starts from the very foundational le level of self-awareness. How self-confident are we? Do we understand our strengths and weaknesses? This is a very basic HR type of question, right? What are your strengths? What are your weaknesses, right? We do our annual review. What are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? Can you honestly articulate what your strengths and your weaknesses are? Or when you mention them, are you, are you giving somebody lip service? I'm going to take off my necklace because I, somebody sent me a message saying that I'm clicking a little bit. Are you, are you going ahead and actually being honest with what your own strengths and weaknesses are? Are you like, oh, you know, one of my uh, weaknesses is that I'm a really hard worker and sometimes I work really hard. And the person's like, oh my goodness, I so get you. Because like one of my, one of my strengths is that, you know, I'm a very humble person and I would never ever humble brag about myself. Right? Like, let, let's be honest about this. Figure out what it is. And it's not that we want to try to strengthen our weaknesses. Strength Finder 2.0, I think it was Marcus Buckingham that wrote that book. Um, Strength Finders 2.0 said that it is not our job to strengthen our weaknesses, but rather continue to strengthen our strength and to find others that have strengths where we have weaknesses to create a balance in an organization. At the second level, this is self-management. And this is about our ability to control our own emotions. <laughs> John, I, my strength is I don't have any weaknesses. <laughs> um, this is our ability to control our own emotions without allowing them to emotionally control us. Now, this was a test in resiliency this year. This was the test of self-management more than any other year. This was the people that despite the world falling apart, despite the whole sky falling, were you still able to be optimistic and positive? Were you still able to be resilient? Were you able to continue to move forward despite the adversity that was in front of you? What this also appears as is trustworthiness from others because we want to follow those that we can fully predict how they are going to react in a situation. We don't want to work with somebody who's going to completely fly off the handle. Somebody who we don't know if one day they're going to be elated and the next day they're going to be depressed. We want to be able to bring ourselves back to a level of equanimity. Now, as sales reps, we are terrible for this, right? When the highs are high and the lows are low, and we will continue to go on that roller coaster of, yes, I got the deal. Oh, I'm the worst person on the team. Yes, I got the deal. Oh, I'm the worst person on the team. Instead, we want to bring ourselves back to a place. My manager didn't say this nearly as eloquently when I was at Xerox. He said, Kim, you're only as good as your next deal. What are you selling next? And I thought, oh my goodness, you've got to be kidding me. But in actuality, this is what he was trying to bring me back to was, yes, it was great to get the, new de the next deal, but remember the next one's still ahead and bring yourself back to equanimity. Social competence is the third level. Now we're starting to take what we know ourselves and push it outwards. And social competence, this is Michael Scott from the office. This is being able to read the room. Do you know what is going on emotionally with others? Can you empathize what is happening with them? 
this is when Michael Scott would walk into the room and everybody's sitting there and they're mourning the poor dead cat. Oh my goodness, poor Fluffy. He was such a great cat. And Michael Scott sees everybody. He's like, awesome, it's a party. Let's have some cake. Let's like break out the maracas. This is not being able to do this. What we rather want to do is when you call up a client, when you're in a sales cycle and the person's like, listen, today's not a very good day. Are you trying to press your own agenda forward? Or are you viewing it as the way it should be? Rather, okay, let's just read what's going on and let's improve this. And then finally at the top level, this is relationship management. So as good as it is to bring ourselves back to equanimity, are we able to therefore bring others back to equanimity? Or do we feed and fuel the fire that persists? When somebody is really low, we're like, oh my goodness, we're Debbie Downer. Things could be a lot worse, let me tell you. And then when they're really high, we're also doing that. Or are we trying to balance them out by giving them an extreme negative or positive as opposed to bringing them back to natural? The other thing about this is can you communicate in a way that doesn't move somebody to fly off the handle? Are you articulating what you need? When a client calls us up and they are just enraged, they, they did not get the service that they expected, their card was double charged, um, they, uh, they are uh, you know, on wit's end because their manager is coming down to them and they're coming down to you, are you able to say in a direct and honest way, we will get there, what do you need? How do we help this? How do we fix this? Or are you going ahead and taking this information and going back and being defensive? Listen, I told you that we would get it to you when we got it to you. We all make mistakes. That doesn't help the relationship. That doesn't help to fuel the emotional status. So some of the emotions we may face in a sales cycle, this might be ourselves, but this might be others. Do we know how to actively maneuver around them? Are we feeling situations of uncertainty? Maybe our client's feeling uncertainty. Maybe we're impatient. Maybe the client's impatient. I wanted that yesterday, right? Are we frustrated? Are we excited? We're working on the, what could be our biggest sales cycle ever and we're so excited, but in turn, we end up moving way too fast and we make too many mistakes. We're not listening to what the client is actually needing. Are we underconfident? Are we overconfident? Maybe the client is somebody that needs to have their ego fed and there's an egotism there. Do we recognize this and are we feeding it? Or are we helping to pull it back and rationalize it and get it to a place where we're bringing it back to neutral? Understanding the various emotions that both parties will face will help us to know how to conquer them. And empathy is so critical that yes, even hostage negotiators, We'll build upon it before what other quote unquote sales 101 techniques will typically talk about. A lot of sales 101 will talk about rapport. They will talk about the value of rapport and I'm not discounting rapport, rapport is important. Rapport is about likability. Rapport is about connection. It is about people just like you do things just like this. People just like you are people just like me. Look at us and we're connected. But trying to build a connection with somebody before we have fully heard them, before we have stood a mile in their shoes and understand where they're coming from, from an emotional status, actually appears to become superficial. And the problem is, is that when we're talking on a superficial level, those that are extreme introverts or even on the ambivert side will see right through us. And right from day one, they will say, this person's trying to sell me. This person is trying to get me to do something that I don't know if I want to do because they're trying to find so many commonalities without even knowing me or who I am. And it will actually move your sales cycle negatively. Whereas when we build empathy and we can do this through the questions we ask and then later on at the end of the sales conversation, talk about rapport, it will help us. And if you don't believe me, go ahead and find any hostage negotiator. Don't put yourself in a hostage negotiation. That is not my recommendation by any means. Or read Never Split the Difference by Chris Voss. He talked about how valuable this is. So the way we want to think about this is as we take our clients on the journey, where are we ultimately moving them to? What is the destination that we are taking them to? 
So when an airline goes ahead and tries to sell you a travel package, perhaps let's say it's Thomas Cook. Thomas Cook Travel goes ahead and tries to sell you on a, de uh, a destination package, a beach vacation. And the first thing they do is they say, okay, awesome, right? Where do you want to be? And he, Thomas Cook, I believe, is ba based in the UK. So right now, London is like rainy and it's cold and it's miserable. Oh, I don't want to be here. And the next place they show you is somewhere beautiful, like the beaches of Spain. <sighs> Wouldn't that be glorious? And what we find are that when they try to talk to us about the beaches of Spain, we all just take a moment and imagine that. We can feel our emotional status uplifting. We can picture the sun on our skin. We can smell that ocean breeze. We can hear the leaves rustling through the trees. Now, what Thomas Cook does is, is they focus you on that emotion, the emotion of being where you will be after you have taken their transportation after you have gotten on that plane. Because if they focused you on the emotions of being on the transportation, on the plane, very few people would get on it to begin with. By focusing the person on the right emotions and the emotions after the service or product has been delivered, now that is something that we strive for. That is something that we ultimately want. So the questions as ourselves, as sales leaders, as entrepreneurs, before we go into any type of sales meeting, is to take the time to truly understand our clients. Why do they want to change? What would have to happen in their business for them to want to take this action? What would they currently have to be feeling right now that they aren't getting. If they are currently in London when it's rainy and it's cold and it's miserable, what are those feelings that they're feeling? And how do we go ahead and get them to articulate that? How do we get them to say what those feelings are? On the flip side, what do they want to be feeling? Where do they want to be? How would it feel when we are there? And what you're going to test for is not, am I asking the right questions? Check mark, check mark, check mark but am I tapping into the right emotions? Do I hear the clients tell me that they're frustrated? Do I hear the emotion? Do I call the emotion out? Do I hear them get excited? Do I hear the emotion? Do I call them out? It sounds like that's really exciting for you. That sounds like that's something that makes you really anticipating the future. Is that right? And who will you become when you're there? And becoming is the ultimate being of feeling. We want people to get emotionally charged with us. We want them to get to a point where we know those emotions because people will always act on emotion and then later on justify this with logic. We've seen this from our own experience. One of the, the most prolific experiences is politics. And I'm not going to talk to you about parties and candidates and everything else like this, but what you will notice is that people will emotionally decide who they want and then logically find the headlines that appeal to that party, to that candidate, to that person. And they will discount everything that does not match their emotional logic. We'll do this by asking better questions. Open-ended questions are some of the best questions. And there's some sales t um, technologies, some t sales trainers out there that will talk to you. I think I saw one article that talked about like seven or 11 different types of questions. Oh my goodness. I couldn't imagine even to, for me, 20 years in the industry, asking 11 different types of questions. I want you to focus on two. There are two types of questions. There are open-ended questions and there are closed-ended questions. And open-ended questions will by far get you the results you need, whereas closed-ended questions will only get you a yes or no answer. Yet too many of us are practiced into asking more closed-ended questions. Are you, could you, do you, should you, right? Are you currently looking for a service provider? Have you worked with somebody like us before? What do you, uh, do you know what you're looking for? Um, and even what is your budget? What is your budget is one of the most terrible questions that you could possibly ever ask it. Never ever ask what is your budget because the only response you're going to get from there is zero or I don't know.
I don't know what my budget is. My budget is nothing. So there you go. Now that you have that, go ahead and provide me the right solution that will get me zero. What is your budget is one of the worst questions. Sorry, my little soapbox rant. My soapbox rant. Whereas when we ask an open-ended question, what do you know about working with a digital marketing agency, right? Uh, what was your experience having someone else do the recruiting and hiring for you? Um, what do you know about our companies? How would you know that's the right company for you? Uh, how will you determine this was a successful project? And when we get there, how will that make you feel? That's powerful, powerful stuff. We need to start preparing our questions as if that is what we're ultimately looking for, not ra rather that we are ultimately checking off the boxes. And we can start to see where the logic and the, the emotional questions will, will start to converge, right? The logical questions, I like to say the logical questions are anything from your neck up. What do you know? What do you see? How would you, like, what would you think it would look like? Um, you know, whatever it is, right? Think, know, see, look, whatever it is, right? What is not working about your current state? state? Whereas what do you feel when you're there? How does, how does this process make you feel every day? I'm frustrated. I'm angry. I, I feel like I am constantly running in a hamster wheel. I am exhausted. <laughs> okay. Right? How would you know the ideal state was perfect for you? Well, I guess it would just be working. I guess we would make more revenue. Oh, but how would that feel to be there? It'd feel good. It feel relief. I, I would finally feel like I was able to focus on the things I needed to focus on. And what else would you like to see or who would you become when you're there? Being questions can actually really move you to the ultimate highest of the pyramid. And they are not going to be appropriate for every sales conversation. But if you can get there, you have them every single time. That story I gave you at the very beginning, the moment we talked about where that woman would end up being, what kind of leader would that become? What would you want your employees to say about you? We talk about legacy. And if whatever your solution is can help somebody to create an even greater legacy, it doesn't matter how much it costs because that is something worth paying for. We need to find out if our client would be willing to pay for the experience that we create in our sales cycles. If you are in a sales meeting, think of your last sales meeting that you were in, the last conversation you had with the client. Maybe it was your first time meeting the client. Maybe it was your fourth time meeting the client. Ask yourself critically, would that client have been willing to pay for that meeting? If I was to charge that person, would they have been willing to pay for that? Now, for most of us, we'll probably say, well, our client, my client definitely wouldn't pay for that meeting. They would pay for the service. And I guess ultimately they would somehow have paid for that meeting. But that's not the question. The question is, have you created enough of an emotional connection? Have you created enough of a relationship? Have you created a transfer of knowledge that that client said, that was well worth an hour of my time? Out of all the things that I could have been doing with that time, this was well worth it. I ask myself this question every single time we do one of these webinars. By the end of it, but when I'm going through it and I'm making my little mini edits and reviewing it and saying, how do I make this better? I ask myself about each one of you. Would you have been willing to do anything else in that time or was this hour well spent for you? And I hope the answer is yes. So we want to look at our clients as if they're the first day for the rest of our lives because they are. We have now, as we go through our entire sales process, this client is going on this amazing journey with us and we want them to ultimately know that we care about them. Emotion happens right from the very first call all the way to the end. And when we get to that proposal, 
when we get to that closed meeting, I want that client to know how much I care. I want to give you Steve's story about this. Steve runs an engineering firm as well. And he didn't believe me specifically about how valuable emotional intelligence was in this conversation. And I asked him to just try it out. I said, just try it. Next time you're in a sales cycle, ask. Ask some of these feeling questions. Ask some of these being questions. And he started off with things that he already was feeling uncomfortable with. But he asked in his sales cycle, well, how would that make you feel? And as he continued on and became more comfortable with how that would make you feel, he asked the person that was ultimately making those decisions, what kind of leader would a project like this allow you to become? What kind of leader do you want to be? And how does a project like this support that? What Steve found was that immediately by asking those questions, his revenue went up four times four times. He says, Kim, I was selling projects now for four times more, more, four times more, the same types of projects than I ever had been before. So if you do nothing else from today, there was a lot of information there. If you do nothing else from today, I want you to take away this one thing. Change the way you ask people how they are doing and to how you are feeling. It is such a simple yet nuanced change that will dramatically change the entire connection you have with somebody. It will be uncomfortable at first and it will be so worth it. Because what you will find is when you call somebody up, when you talk to them, when you have your next Zoom meeting with somebody, and instead of giving your little nuance, how are you doing? How are you, how are you doing today? You will change it to, how are you feeling? Watch the floodgates start to open. The other thing about asking, how are you feeling? Is it so tiny, but what it ultimately does is it creates a microscopic moment of intention. The person does this real quick check, how am I feeling? It is a shorter distance from the head to the mouth than it is from the heart to the mouth. And it may take them a second longer to respond. But what they will respond is, I'm feeling good. I'm feeling fine. It may be the same response as they would have given you, how am I doing? But now that I have connected, what am I feeling? Instead of to what I am doing, what am I doing? What am I doing? What am I doing? To how am I feeling? I become much more optimistic, open, and receptive to new information. Try it. Tell me how you, uh, how you like it. If, uh, if you love this tip, don't forget to put a little social media shout out. Say that you had attended today's webinar and that this, this is your one takeaway. Anita said that she was finding that with every single time that she kept practicing that. She ended up having better communications, not just in her sales, but in her personal relationships. Doug ended up using more emotional intelligence to finalize a six-figure deal. And by getting the client to explain more about how they were feeling and what they ultimately wanted to achieve and how that would make them feel, they came back and asked him to add on more to the project because they loved working with him that much. And finally, Cameron, who watched me do this presentation in a one-on-one -on -one setting a year ago and told me, Kim, this will never, ever work in my industry. And I told him, that's up to you, but try it out. And he took that last tip and he asked the person that he was this close to the sale, the end of the sales, but they just could not get over that hump. They just couldn't get over that hump. And he says, well, how do you feel about all the conversations we've had so far? And the client was taken back. And they said, you know what? We feel really good about this. So why aren't we moving forward? 
Cameron called me not even an hour after that presentation to tell me that it was like magic or something. I couldn't believe how fast that worked in my own business. So if your hand is sore, maybe you took a crazy amount of notes, I'm gonna get you the slides. Um, we also have our sales funnel uh, cycle page. We didn't cover that one today, but we cover it usually in every single um, conversation because emotional intelligence doesn't fit perfectly within a sales cycle. It should be something that we involve ourselves into the entire process. If you're just trying to figure out where your sales cycle is or how do you make that as a process, just go to our website, kamorleski.com slash ko dash webinars. There's a download there for you to get that um, as well as some more information. We do all of this because if LinkedIn calls me their most influential sales leader to follow, Zig Ziglar has been my most influential sales leader to follow. And I love it so much that we actually made this our number one value in our company is that you could have everything you want in life if you help enough people get what they want. My entire team lives by this saying. And I hope today you were able to move yourself forward. I hope you were able to go ahead and get something more of what you want. And we will continue to be there for you for whatever else is next. You are all unofficial KO Sales, you graduates today. So I'm gonna end every classroom the same way as we do with all of our formal classrooms. What are you going to do differently today that is gonna have an impact on your business? Education is not the same as application. And you need to take something, you can't take it all, I get it, there was a lot there today. Take one thing, maybe it was the one thing I told you about changing your question to how does it feel? Maybe it's following up with somebody. Maybe it's just being more in tune with your own emotional state, doing a check-in, asking yourself, is this right? Put it in the chat as well. Tell me what you're taking away from today. One thing, one thing is all I'm asking you for. I do have time for a few questions. Uh, we have approximately nine minutes. Uh, if you haven't gotten the link, um, again, there it is as well, kimorleski.com slash ko dash webinars is the place you want to go to get uh, more information to get some additional downloads we have a ton of resources for you because i truly want to see all of you sell more faster thank you so much i know that you had options to do with your hour today and i am so grateful you decided to to take the time to spend it with with me and my team um, yeah, Jim says, uh, you know, how are you feeling today, right? Such a change, you know, how do you feel helping enough people will get yourself? Yes, thank you. Um, yes, absolutely. Oh my goodness, Alan already has some great takeaways for his next meeting, so that's fantastic. He's already gonna start to apply this, which is exactly what I wanna see. I'm definitely be asking, how are you feeling? Um, John is applying this in an hour. Yes, John, tell me what your result is. Go ahead and post something on social media afterwards. Tell people how amazing this webinar was. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Oh, good, good. I'm so glad that most of you are taking that. It is such a subtle difference, but it will make transformation happen in front of you for all of your conversations. Thank you all so very much for uh for attending this today with us uh, yes absolutely i'm so glad yeah you know i mean honestly when we whenever we look at our sales cycles and we start to ask ourselves how would this appear to a client if i was a client how would i want this to appear it will change the way you start to ask questions and network and just be more natural in your sales conversations because that's really what this is about i mean we shouldn't feel like we're ever selling anybody we shouldn't be there just like here's a bunch of information now go throw it on a wall and see what sticks but rather how do we just connect as people how do we make this happen yeah thank you uh thank you for adult, modeling adult learning you're absolutely welcome jim absolutely right we want to try to make it engaging we uh we do our very best um our our classrooms are even more engaging than this this is we have a lot of people in there we limit our class sizes and so there's a lot more interactivity a lot more applying a lot more role modeling and practicing um, as we go forward because we want you all to be comfortable become confident become sales of, like knockouts at the end of the day. 
Um, yes, I will be keeping in mind a potential client rather than spend time doing something. Yes, absolutely, Jessica. Fantastic. Um, yes. Oh, oh, thank you, Claudio. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and presenting on Zoom. Yeah, absolutely. You know, if um, if you're having to give a presentation, I mean, you know, like like myself, I said, I stand up. I actually have a light right behind my my back of my computer that shines directly on me. Um, this is a green screen. I know it looks like I have this really cool lofty New York apartment, but it's, uh, it's, it's all magic, right? Smoke and mirrors, but, um, but everything is elevated. Okay. Thank you all. No more further questions. I will shut you down. Uh, you have an absolutely amazing week. I hope most of you have gone to our website already and downloaded what we have. You have an absolutely wonderful day. I hope you feel amazing for the rest of this week. Bye-bye for now.